probably one of the challenges, you know, that does face us, that as we get an older population, that we probably need to not just know whether people are actually taking these things, but actually, you know, once they're being delivered, do they ever even leave the box? And that's what Lely was very much a very powerful episode with Lely about, you know, she does a lot in patients' homes, so she's kind of fixing it all together. So that's great. Oh, we forgot to pick you up on the word using the phrase going forward, Mark, but no, it's past now. That's one of the phrases we're not allowed to use on the podcast. Oh, right. Is there any others? Self-censure. We've probably already said the others. Absolutely. Steve says it's six times an episode. Amazing. I say that a few times. (laughs) Yeah, we're not very good at keeping to it. I had a phone call years ago uh, when I was up in North Wales. He was from a professor of of, of something and he said, my 96-year-old dad has just passed away. How come he's got 800 paracetamol in the house? And I said, oh, look, I said, that's, you know, there's nobody to blame. I said, that is the system. So, yeah, very real. I was home a couple of weeks ago and my mum said, and my heart sank, can you have a look at your dad's medicines? (laughs) He's not about 15 and I thought, oh, my God. Like you, Mark, it's one of those ones where you think, I'm not sure I want to get involved. The Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill.com. So Mark, I'm sure you're aware that one of the pleasures of coming onto the Oral Apothecary is to give us a desert island drug. So what would you like to offer us? Well, you're not going to like this, Steve. I'm only going to choose one drug, but it depends about what the facilities are on this desert island. A few years ago, as you may remember, I suffered a pulmonary embolism. I do remember, yeah. And I'm on lifelong warfarin. So if I can go on this desert island and I can have my INR measured, I'll carry on taking warfarin. If I can't can't have my INR measured. I'm afraid it's a DOAC. And my DOAC of choice, just to upset you even more, would be a Pixaban 2.5 milligrams twice a day. So the ball's in your call. Is there any anticoagulation clinic facilities on said desert island? <laughs> For the record and the listener, Mark, and he talked about his dad earlier, but we always were having conversations, weren't we, about anticoagulation. And I always remember you saying that you tried to stay out of, because I I think your dad was, it was, you know, should he be anticoagulated? And you said to me, oh, I I really want to keep out of it. And I do remember when you had the PE. And like you said, at the time, of course, DOAX hadn't been out that long, had they? And and so we were both, I think, you know, conservative with a small C, I think, about these drugs, because the jury was out. And let's be honest, it was out. So you've always remained on warfarin, right? You never went over to a DOAC. And so in this sort of theoretical case, of course, listening to all of our guests over the last, particularly this series, is whatever matters to you, Mark. You can have whichever you want. Okay, I'll stick for the warfarin. And I'll tell you why I'll stick with the warfarin, preferentially to the apixaban, because, you know, you do start to look at these things in more detail when you're on them. And there is a little bit of subgroup analysis that does suggest that warfarin gives you some protection against coronary artery disease. And we've also got a very strong family history of coronary artery disease. I would like to be greedy and also carry on on the desert island taking my statin, but I somehow imagine that you're going to forbid that. So I'll just take the warfarin and hope that that just gives me that little edge and that the diet will be quite frugal on the desert island, which will hopefully help to keep my cholesterol under control. Just the brown ones though, Mark. (laughs) Just the brown ones, yep. Okay, yeah, you could have one milligram warfarin tablets. That's a done deal, okay? (laughs) Into the oral apothecary desert island drug list excellent so what about a career anthem then something that means something to you perhaps in your career for a personal reason or otherwise so this was an impossible question and i've listened to what other people say it's not only an impossible question but i actually think it's a fantastic question because is what you've made me realize is that things that i really like listening to are not going to make it so sadly i'm not going to get any smiths in i'm not going to get any morrissey in i'm not going to get any mott the hoople in it's all going to struggle and I've gone for a song which is by a Canadian called R. Dean Taylor and the song is There's a Ghost in My House. It's a great tune and the reason I'm going to go with that one is this. Firstly, you and I have both worked in Manchester and but one of the things that we did miss uh, during our time was Northern Soul that predated us by a good 20 years. But I do think that that's a great genre of music as well so that's worth listening to. I don't think genre's a band. No, no, genre's good. No, genre's good. Yeah, we like the genre. Genre's good. So it's a great genre, which we both missed. But this song is actually a song about reflection. And it's a guy basically reflecting on a lost relationship. But I do think that reflection is a huge, huge part of medicine. And I think it really is the best way to learn. There are a few people who are gifted enough to say they've never got anything wrong, but we've all got things wrong. And I think anyone who says that they've never had a case in medicine that hasn't gone wrong, they've just never seen enough patients. And consequently, I can't speak for pharmacists, but I can certainly speak for all 
all doctors who, you know, not in situations like this where we're, you know, perhaps just having a bit of fun and a bit of banter. You know, when you talk to people seriously, everyone's got that regret. Everyone is definitely living with that memory and that ghost in their mind that if you could turn something back in your life it would be something to do with a patient I'm pretty sure that that would apply to all doctors you know all of us in our lives would like to say if I'd done this differently if I'd done that differently I reckon that for most doctors we've all got that case that would be up there with anything that we would change in our lives so I think that's why the song's there you could argue it's a slightly sort of melancholy way of taking it but basically it is a great tune I think it does reflect the fact that when one is getting closer to the end of one's career than you are to the beginning the one thing that you've got is wisdom and that you don't jump in and you do start to think well if only I had done one or two things differently along the way so that's the song Mark it fits perfectly with something we'll talk about later Um, I'm going to mention Brian Goldman who's also Canadian a physician And his TED talk about, can we talk about mistakes? He uses the word with physicians, do you remember? And generally, there's no good coming after those words. You know, when somebody comes up to you and says, do you remember such and such a patient? And and all of a sudden, there's an adrenaline flush. So we'll come on to that a bit in the micro discussion, perhaps. Well, you saying that has made my stomach flip over because I've got one that instantly popped into my head. But it's also about, and particularly during current times, is about the importance of giving clinicians and people in in our sort of world that time to reflect, not just on their own, but with other people as well. And it's not deemed important. And well, the proximity isn't there at the moment to do it. And it's not deemed important. So I think that that idea of reflection is, you know, it's come up again. It's really important. Do you remember when Lely said about the art of conversation? And she said, it's about conversations with patients, it's about conversation with others but it's also about conversations with yourself and that really strikes a chord doesn't it with that there's a ghost in my house r dean taylor excellent that will definitely go into the oral apothecary spotify playlist thank you mark very thoughtful as i knew it would be what about a book choice then for the library do you know in a funny way this wasn't quite as difficult the automatic thing nowadays would probably have gone to have picked one of those guru books it does seem that there's a plethora of books whereby people are basically telling us how we need to do it from a patient's centered approach and all of the rest of it and I do like reading those books because you do learn a lot but sometimes they do frustrate me just a little bit because you feel that they're just talking down to you just that you know they just there's a little bit that they're just that little bit better than the rest of us I've parked all of those and I'm actually going to choose a textbook and it's a textbook that I read when I was a medical student and the book is called Psychological Medicine the author of the edition that I had was called Peter's Story I was always fascinated intellectually and academically by psychiatry. I could never have done it for a career. When we were undergraduates, we used to have to spend the first two years doing old-fashioned preclinical and we used to do nine examinations and in the first year one of the examinations was medical statistics and in the second year we used to do psychology and sociology and there was this urban legend that if you failed medical statistics it wasn't so important and they'd probably let you through if you did okay in anatomy and physiology and in the second year if you did okay in things like endocrinology and, and reproduction they'd probably let you through on psychology and sociology but when you actually practice practice medicine, you realise that the two most important subjects are understanding statistics and numbers. And the other thing to understand health properly, because the definition of health, as you know, is physical, psychological and social well-being, is to understand those two aspects. So they're clearly undervalued. But when we got onto clinical psychiatry, I read this book and the book is brilliant. And it's not brilliant in as much as it gives you facts. It does give you facts, but it actually tells stories. And I think that that storytelling is a skill that is completely underutilized in learning medicine in any form, whether it's medicine, medicine, whether it's nursing, whether it's you guys in pharmacy. Storytelling is important because storytelling gives context. And if you've got no context, you're never ever going to learn anything. And if you've got context, you can then understand it, then you can memorize it, and then you can mold it into the shape that it needs to be. So that's the book I would give you. I'm sure there are books out there nowadays that are better at storytelling, but that's the book. When I used to plow through books 
as a medical student, which I did used to do. I never enjoyed them. It was work. But I remember picking this book up and finding this book completely fascinating because it made me understand other people, but it also made me understand myself. You know, my own neuroses that I'd always lived with. You're never quite sure of yourself because one of the things you never do is talk to people about your own neuroses and things that go on in your own mind because you think, am I a bit, you know, <laughs> am, am I a bit crazy? A little bit, whoa, a little bit, whoa. Yeah, and then you read that everyone's got these things and you suddenly realise, well, actually, I'm, I'm normal after all. It's a genius book and I just think anyone should read it. Jamie, you're into stories, actually, aren't you? I do a lot on storytelling, Mark, and here we are. Here's a question for you. How did I, as a pharmacist, save a life on the way to a storytelling workshop that I was running? I think it's the only life I've ever saved. No, it's a conundrum. Not going to solve that one. No, I was two miles into my journey. The car in front of me stopped at the traffic lights. The lights turned green and the car didn't move and I started you know what do you do in that situation is you get very cross and angry don't you and then all of a sudden I thought I thought oh hello something's not right in that car and there was a baby in the back seat in a bucket seat mum and grandmum were in the uh, in the front seats and they were still reaching over and so I <laughs> so I got out these aren't words really you want to hear in a medical emergency are you it's okay I'm a pharmacist um, <laughs> but, but I did say that just to reassure them that I wasn't some nutter walking towards them and the baby was blue in the bucket seat still strapped in and they hadn't moved him at all. And so I reached in on instinct thinking, oh, my God. And as I pressed the bucket seat clip, you know, the clips that you got on the front, that was enough for him. And I think he probably would have done it on his own to expel what he'd been choking on. That was 10 minutes in to a three hour journey that I was going to deliver a storytelling workshop for healthcare professionals. I scoured the local papers for weeks after to see if, you know, and this was before social media was a thing, not a jot. You're a hero, Jamie. You're a hero. We know that, Gimmo. <laughs> so I think storytelling, in a way, I think it's taught out of us as healthcare professionals, particularly elders, because we look at the hierarchy of evidence and what's at the bottom of the hierarchy of evidence it's it's anecdotes isn't it and stories and so we're almost told not to trust them and i think it's not a hierarchy they they have an equal place alongside the more robust sorts of evidence and we use them a lot in improvement and we've talked about behavioral change you can quote as many randomized control trials as you want people will remember a compelling story much more than they will a load of graphs i can recommend a book here because i do a bit of writing myself um, john york into the woods how stories work and why we tell them and it, it breaks down why stories have the effect on people that they do so if people are interested in stories i recommend that book that's your second book recommendation in 20 minutes and is it just me mark i expect you thought about this a lot but it's actually psychological medicine by peter what's his surname story story not just thrown together stc <laughs> i know genius right well that'll definitely go into your all apothecary library okay thanks mark brilliant before we move on to this week's micro discussion um this is the last episode of series two so i'm just going to ask my fellow apothecaries what are your series two highlights gimmo loads to be honest it's just it's been good fun hasn't it i found it a bit harder this time i think when we did the first series we were in covid fully and things in the evening we're a bit quieter but it's been great fun been great seeing you guys again the sheer breadth and depth of the topics we've discussed and some of the great people we've met on the way so here's just some of the topics we've been through shared decision making nice guidance homelessness the broken medical model medication review chronic kidney injury the art of prescribing health economics technology solutionism gp practice pharmacy deep prescribing veterinary medicine non-medical prescribing Wicked Problems, Polypharmacy and Zebras. And that's just some of it. But one memory for me was Mark Porter. He sort of delivered a bit of sucker punch because he pulled his book choice out of the bag, which was really unusual. It was um, It Shouldn't Happen to a Vet by James Herriot. And that was just one of those childhood memories because it was a book my nan used to read with me. And it just brought back in that instant a load of um, quite a lot of emotions, to be honest. Um, I'm now rereading my third book. I'm now rereading it. it. It Shouldn't Happen to a Vet by James Herriot. This is such a wicked question. It's a different wicked to what Lely was on about but this is a wicked question when you have to pick highlights so like Gimmo you know it's all been great fun and I think decision making and conversations is the way I would describe what series two has been about actually there was one word that I absolutely loved and it did come from you Jamie and that was the word jargon monoxide I absolutely love that and I've used it much since yes not mine you understand but yes I introduced it I know to but the... you pinched it 
If you knew who to attribute it to, you would have, wouldn't you? Well, Bob Sutton, I did. Bob Sutton. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. So that was genius. I absolutely loved the force of nature that is Lely Oboe. And we've had a lot of feedback for that particular episode. And we weren't meaning that we don't need process. Like Mark said, you know, I'm very big on systems and you've got to have systems. But you also have got to have the art of conversation to be able to get down to the nitty gritty, which is a little bit of what Mark's just been talking about. So I think the whole Lely Oboe episode was absolutely absolutely brilliant. I think the other thing that sticks out for me is the empty chair, Professor Rachel Elliott. I mean, that was just 